you believe in God? Up until 200 years ago, the question would have seemed stupid to most people. Then, God's existence was taken for granted by almost everyone. And much of what happened in the world was directly attributed to his all-pervasive power. But by the 18th century, science had changed the way we viewed the world. Indeed, Galileo came to view not only this world, but others through his telescope. While Isaac Newton showed us why apples fall to the ground, because the whole universe is subject to the force of gravity. Even so, most people still accepted the Bible as truth. And they continued to believe that all the people living on this earth were under the care of an almighty and all-powerful God. He's also supposed to be perfectly good and perfectly just. And yet, the universe he has created contains many evils, some of which are clearly the creation of humankind itself, as well as the natural horrors of earthquakes, droughts, plagues, cancers. The list is seemingly endless. Surely a good God cannot permit a world filled with such evil. The dreaming spires of Oxford are a long way from the killing fields of Bosnia, the death camps of the Third Reich, and the mud-filled trenches of the Somme. Yet it's here, amongst the ivory towers of Academe, where leaders of church and state have been educated and trained for hundreds of years, that the discipline of moral philosophy has been argued and refined. In the first of Channel 4's two Oxford debates on the case for the existence of God, distinguished philosophers, theologians, thinkers and commentators have gathered along with interested students who will contribute to tonight's debate on the problem of evil. We start formally with a proposition. There is evil, therefore there cannot be a God. The case against the existence of God is presented by writer Karen Armstrong. The God on trial in this debate is the God of classical theism, the first cause of all things, the omnipotent creator who is good, just and compassionate. Even though God is essentially beyond time and change, Jews, Christians and Muslims have always believed that he is active in the world and that his activity can be discerned in historical events. But some of these events seem to belie the goodness and justice of God. Nature is red in tooth and claw. Natural disasters, flood, famine and pestilence cause untold suffering to millions of innocent human beings. And what of those evils that are the result of human wickedness? According to conventional theology, there is nothing in the world that God did not create. Nothing that does not depend upon him for its existence. So in some sense, evil must derive from God too. If God is all-powerful, why does he not smite the oppressor as he promised the prophets of ancient Israel? It is impossible to reconcile the Nazi Holocaust, the Gulag, and as we speak, the genocide in Bosnia with a God who is rational, just and compassionate. If God is all-powerful, he could have prevented the Holocaust. If he could have stopped it, but decided not to, he is morally impossible and irrational. If he was unable to stop it, he is impotent and useless. The traditional answer is that God does not will evil, he merely allows it. This studied indifference and detachment might suit the God of Aristotle, but it has nothing to do with the God of the Bible. What kind of divine personality could look on while the crematoria blazed and six million Jews went to their death? If the God of classical theism exists, he was present in Auschwitz. But if he is compassionate and just, how could he have been there and done nothing to prevent it. An authoritarian God who controls everything and is therefore literally responsible for everything that happens on earth is equally worrying, since it makes God directly accountable for such atrocities as the Holocaust. But if we decide to safeguard God's compassion by saying that, for some reason, it is impossible for God to act, what becomes of his omnipotence? Some Jewish and Christian theologians have recently suggested that God is in fact helpless in the face of human evil. But 
Can we really sacrifice God's omnipotence in this way without him somehow ceasing to be the God of classical theism? And what use is an impotent God? Religion, of course, is not necessarily about God, let alone the God of classical theism. Its task is to combat evil and to help people to cultivate a serious understanding of the sacred, inviolable nature of human life. In Britain, God has simply died as a religious idea for many people who find him incredible, irrelevant, and boring. Yet there is spiritual hunger. Some have attempted to flee the vacuum that God has left behind by seeking the idols and false certainties of fundamentalism. The conventional God should not be used to find an explanation for these dark events in a facile way. Such a God can even give us a bad example, since by allowing these atrocities to happen, he justifies our own apathy and acceptance of these profoundly unacceptable happenings. Auschwitz is a timely reminder that our ideas about God are always dispensable. Karen Armstrong, thank you. Passionate atheism, Father McCabe, I would doubt you would espouse, but I invite you now to put the case for the existence of God, dealing with the problem of evil and the proposition, let me remind you, there is evil, therefore there cannot be a God. Father McCabe. The huge achievement of the Jews, inherited by Christianity and Islam, was to recognize that the only object worthy of human religious worship had to be not a tribal god, not even their own tribal god, but the creator of the entire universe. This Jewish inheritance is classical theism. This tradition doesn't suggest, but rather denies, that God is a personality like ourselves writ large. That would be an idol. Classical theism asks the most radical question of all. Why is there anything rather than nothing? Recognizing both that there has to be an answer and that we don't and cannot know what it is. We are confronted here by a mystery because whatever would answer such a question couldn't be any part of our universe couldn't be classified as this kind of thing rather than that. We, we simply stand before God in awe and gratitude for the sheer gift of existence. And it's a sheer gift, because whatever the act of creation may be, it cannot be God attaining some advantage. If we ask, why would God create the world? We can only answer, well, it must be because he loves and delights in these things being themselves. Notice that when we say something is bad or an evil, we always mean that it is in some way defective, failing to fulfill our expectations for this kind of thing. Evil is not the name of a thing or of a feature of a thing. It refers to what's lacking to a thing or to a person not to what's there. God creates what is there. This is not to make evil less real. Nothing in the wrong place can be just as real as something in the wrong place, as was, say, the hole in my sock. And if you inadvertently drive your car over a cliff, you will have nothing to worry about. It's the nothing you have to worry about. Defects are of two kinds those inflicted by something else and those peculiar to free beings that are self-inflicted. That's to say there's evil that's just suffered and there's evil done, which is moral evil. The lamb suffers evil inflicted by the tiger. The thing to notice here, though, is that the lamb doesn't suffer because the tiger is bad, but because it's good but a good tiger. It's a tiger that's good at being a tiger that brings it about that the lamb becomes bad at being a lamb. Becomes a mutton instead. With evil suffered, at least the tiger flourishes 
while it damages, damages the lamb. But moral evil has no winners. The very agent that inflicts the evil is the one diminished by it. A moral evil, of course, very commonly occurs in hurting other people. But that's not precisely what makes it morally evil. The moral badness is in the agent, not at all in the external victim. What beggars the imagination about the Holocaust is surely not simply the colossal number of those who suffered. Actually, probably fewer than will be killed by a natural disaster such as the AIDS epidemic. No, what beggars our imagination is that it was such a staggering case of human moral evil, of deliberate and calculated evil done. The belief that died at Auschwitz was not the belief in God. What died was belief in the inherent and necessary goodness and decency of human beings. Let's open the debate up now to the floor of writers, academics, thinkers uh, who are sitting on these benches. Now, the burden lies with Karen Armstrong, who is supporting the proposition. So most of the people here are here to challenge her argument. But she is not without supporters. It's the architecture of this divinity school in the Bodleian Library that sets these benches in opposition. But I should warn you not to anticipate that each bench speaks with one voice. And nor should we anticipate a simple trade of expressions of conviction for or against the existence of God. We are here to hear the arguments. Um, Rabbi Sidney Brickto, would you like to, to kick off with your response? Well, I must say I was more sympathetic, much to my surprise, with the impassioned atheism of Karen Armstrong than the logical arguments uh, of Father McCabe. The dean of my rabbinical college said to us, boys, you're selling a stock of trade which died 300 years ago, and by which he meant the classical God who's both all powerful and all good. But where I disagree with Karen Armstrong is when she says that to say he is not all powerful makes him impotent and useless. My parents were not all powerful but they were not impotent and useless in guiding me and helping me to lead what I consider decent life. Evil in the world doesn't disprove God. It proves that there's a need for God to help humanity overcome the evil, whether it's within himself or outside himself. And I do not see why, when there's been so much change in the universe, in every area of knowledge and science, why are we not allowed to change the God concept? Why must we be stuck with the God of our forefathers and our ancestors? Surely we have a right to change that too. The reality of God, we don't know anything about. We can't be sure the nature of that reality. What we can be sure is the nature of that God to which we can have a response and who speaks to our human heart. But for the mass of humanity, who cannot accept God on the basis that God is pictured as all-powerful, the challenge for religious people is to come up with a God who can be part of our discourse in our attempt to improve the world and to prevent future Auschwitz. Is that an argument, Professor Anthony Flew? Um, well, I think the rabbi is absolutely right. If you're going to make sense of the idea of a God who's going to be good, he's got to be non-omnipotent. Um, when I first became an atheist, I used to argue on the lines of Karen Armstrong. I think that's still right. If you treat the talk about God being good and just seriously, um, uh, but I came to realize after reading Hobbes and also reading the Quran, uh, that Hobbes was most formidable of all British political thinkers. Hobbes was absolutely right in saying uh, that at least many people, uh, when they praise God, are um, uh, not using the terms justice and goodness in their philosophical signification, but simply praising a power, glorifying a power. Well, this comes out very clearly in the Quran, 
uh, where Allah is presented as a cosmic Saddam Hussein, omnipotent and concerned above all that everyone should obey. And if you don't obey, you'll be tortured forever. Now, you should be met by uh, an old uh, adversary of yours, Professor Richard Swinburne. Have you heard that before? Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh... Can I just qualify to start with one thing that Karen Armstrong said about omnipotence. God is supposed to be omnipotent, he can do anything, but classical theism always qualified that, or almost always qualified that, by saying he could do anything logically possible, anything the ex uh, account of which did not involve a self-contradiction. So, uh, if there, the charge from evil is that there isn't an, uh, is, is that there isn't an omnipotent God, it, it must show that it's logically possible. That is to say, there's no contradiction in supposing that God can bring about uh, certain uh, good states without, at the same time, bringing about evil states. And there is the rub, because there, certainly God could give us lots of kicks of pleasure uh, without any evil being with it. But if he's to give us some of the greater goods, I'm afraid that evil must come with it. Temporary, limited evil, suffering of not tremendous cosmic significance, but nevertheless evil with it. Ed Pierce. The, the question is God's intervention in reasonable ways. Well, man's intervention also happens. The Holocaust has been called an issue. Man had a pretty good idea of Auschwitz and Treblinka. And it was open to man to bomb the marshalling yards and the railway lines. And man, in the person of Sir Arthur Harris, whom we commemorate in the Strand, chose to bomb Dresden and innocent people instead. Whether that is a comment upon man, well, it certainly is a comment upon man, whether it is also a comment upon God is perhaps at the heart of everything we have to say. Because if we can go back to Father McCabe's analogy of the tiger and the lamb, it's elegantly put. It's, it's as sophisticated as you would expect it to be from Father McCabe, but it is sanitized. The tiger, he says, was a good tiger, doing that part of creation for which God had intended him. But then Hitler was a good Hitler. Cholera is a good cholera. The National Rifle Association is a good National Rifle Association. All the means by which evil comes are good at accomplishing that. A number of points there, but Father McCabe, yeah, perhaps you'd like to deal with small, uh, quick one. Um, I think that um, the tiger is a good tiger. It's that kind of thing. It's, it is a tiger, and it's good at being a tiger. I think that Hitler was very bad at being human, and that's the kind of thing he was. And when we, uh, most people, I suppose, would agree. To talk of him as a good Hitler makes no sense. It's not the way we, the way we use the word good. But that he, was a, he was not, didn't succeed in being a good human being, I think we, most of us would probably agree. Peter Vardy. I have to say I warm more to Karen Armstrong's position because I do think that at the center of Christianity is the idea of the personality and love of God. And although we have to be careful about how we use those words, I think that they are ideas which if we give up, then she's right in saying we give up God. And therefore, I tend to favor her approach in a very real way. If in fact you look at the Gospels, we don't in fact have a picture of an omnipotent God. We have a picture of a God who is in fact considerably constrained. The one thing that Jesus promised his disciples was not that everything would go well, but that the light he represented wouldn't be put out. Far from an omnipotent God, we have a God who comes into a world sunk in darkness and has to fight against it. In many ways, I want to stand with Karen Armstrong at the side of the lime pits in Fablinka and Auschwitz, and I want to share her horror at what happened there. And I think that any attempt to theologize in the presence of that or to excuse God, I'm very uncomfortable with. But while I stand there with her, I want to take a different end position from her. I want to say, I share her horror. I share her outrage at what happens. And I cannot actually understand the meaning or the reason for that. But having said that, I am willing to trust even though I can't understand. And I would be proud to stand with her there and to respect the fact that she says, I stand and reject that God. Hopefully then we could turn away and share a joint endeavor to fight against that sort of evil. Our proposition is that there is evil, therefore there cannot be our God rather than there cannot be God. And, and we are hearing of more than one God perhaps already in this debate, but that wouldn't surprise you, uh, Dr. Atkins. 
Not in the least. I think I, I'm getting, from what I hear this evening, a license to go out raping and murdering after we close down. It's going to be a wonderful evening because I shall give people the opportunity to, to, to find their God in the face of my actions. And I find that an extraordinary proposition. I think it was, I think it was um, Voltaire who said that people who believe in absurdities commit atrocities. I think we, we certainly see that in our current world. But I also think this evening we are seeing that people who believe in absurdities commit, are committed to intellectual contortion because they set up this absurd idea that there is this thing out there, this unknowable thing out there that we have to spend our life kowtowing to. And then we have to rationalize what we actually see going on around us. We see people being slaughtered. We see people, perhaps not by me later this evening, being raped and murdered, but certainly being raped and murdered. And I think it's extraordinary that God has let people um, indulge in that kind of activity. I think we can actually see the origins of what it is that... Um, of, Father McCabe and once uh, Mother Armstrong were, 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 were saying that if, if we see why we have come to the point where we think that there is a sense of good and a sense of evil in the world, and it must be in the survival of our species. We must find the origin of the way we behave and therefore our judgment about what is good and what is wrong in the fact that we have found a way of surviving. Sitting beside you, uh, Sister Eva Heyman, c can you enlighten Peter Atkins, who finds extraordinary contortions in, in, in the arguments for the existence of God so far? Um, I'm not sure that I'm able to enlighten him, but what I would like to do is to contribute perhaps a concrete reply to Karen Armstrong's argument and I too find myself surprised that in some ways I would echo some of her thinking. But before that, I need to say that I was brought up in a Jewish family and lived in Germany until 1939. And a family that was touched by the Holocaust with one survivor. And one survivor from my, not nuclear family, but an aunt. And my own experience of living in Nazi Germany until 39 um, certainly made me feel the absence of God. And during my adolescence, I could not believe that there could be a God who could allow that kind of evil. But I have come over a period of 60 odd years uh, to believe that the power of love is stronger than the power of evil. And the surviving aunt that I referred to said to me that she learned that in three years in Theresienstadt. I feel that one has to go out and look for God because God's around us. And if we turn our backs on him, and I'm sure in the concentration camps, the backs were turned on God and the evil took over. And I really believe that um, God is there if we look for him. So I that because people turned away from God, they were punished in the concentration camps? I believe that the force of evil and the devil who tempts... That's an extraordinary thing is very much around well, as well. The rabbis say, where is God? And the answer is, well, you let him in. That's well, what you say. Yes. It's, uh, that's very reasonable and credible. What I don't understand is why we're arguing about the goodness of evil. Obviously, there has to be evil in the world. The rabbi, the rabbinic master said, if, you, if God hadn't created the evil incarnation, men wouldn't compete, they wouldn't have families, they wouldn't have children. The purpose of God is to help us restrain the evil, to sublimate it, to help us to live with it, and to, and to do something with it to make a better sure, world out of it. Ineffable but, weakness. But, but God was omnipotent. But he's not. <laughs> <laughs> but God, <laughs> everybody, he's <laughs> not. But what, with enemies like Karen, this, who needs friends. No, but Karen, yeah. Armstrong, Karen Armstrong was arguing that we could accept an omnipotent God, and I'm supporting the view that the concept of God can change. It's been said here, fine, 
let's find a God whom we can talk to and, and can inspire us. That must be a limited God. For the atheist who won't have any trouble with any God, it's not an answer. But for me and for many others, it could be. Peter Hepplethwaite. Yes, I want to address the, uh, the improved human creatures that you think God should have created who couldn't cause suffering to each other. Having thought for some time about this, I think the ideal shape is round, like billiard balls. <clears throat> then we could all bounce off each other, rather like the dodgems, if you like. Wouldn't do any harm. For that, of course, we'd have to be insensible as well. So we'd never fall in love. And it consequently, could never be rejected. So, you know, what sort of creatures would these improved human beings be? They wouldn't be human at all. And I think that is, that is the weakness of the tremendous sense of moral superiority which one sees in Ed Pierce here. Uh, he admitted it himself. He said he felt a bit uppity. And even Karen herself, who doesn't have these qualities, of course, <clears throat> tells us that this is a discovery of the last 50 years. It's only in the last 50 years that she's advanced, or people have advanced, sensitive people, like herself, have advanced to this understanding of evil, which means that God is impossible. I'm charged by, I'm charged with moral superiority. I would say that the corporate moral superiority of a church which can confront the evil of the archipelago and give us, as it were, God of the White Sea Canal and say out of that came a number of serious distinguished believers is putting, uh, well, is relating the alloy to the clinker in a remarkably new way and seeing uh, a byproduct as God's labor in life. I wanted to take up the profound truth that I think Rabbi Brichter gave us earlier on when he spoke of, uh, to the heart of this argument, by saying that his parents had seemed omnipotent, and of course were not, but neither, but absolutely they were good. Absolutely they were reasons for all kinds of good in his life. And that therefore it was not necessary to take up with God, the great God, the great promulgator argument, sufficient to take up God, the body of ethics, God, the admonisher of kindness and, and mercy, God, many virtues, a compromise, puts the rabbi, if you like, in grave danger of being accused by conservatives with and without capital C's of being trendy, of being a sort of Jewish answer to David Jenkins. He can live with this. He's offering, if you like, a, a, a minimalist case, but it seems to me the one that's easily the most attractive. Because if we are just God, because of what we now know about man, we can surely justify that by going back to the fact that historically we have always played with God to make him fit the purposes of man. They see God in the sort of light that Rabbi Brichter was describing to us. And as far as I'm concerned, that is the intelligent compromise to the question tonight. In political terms, it's a sort of, um, a sort of Harold Macmillan-ish, wet kind of God, whereas Father McCabe is stuck, whether he likes it or not, despite his political position, with God as Mrs. Thatcher. Oh, I just simply want to say that I think that's historically quite false. Uh, that in point of fact, uh, the reason why uh, there developed in the Western world a conviction about the infinite value of human beings uh, was not that this spontaneously erupted in people's consciousness, but that they became convinced that people, all people, were created and redeemed by God, and therefore were of infinite value. It was a religious conception which produced the ethical uh, idea, not the other way around. How do you see that against the consensus that seems to be emerging that God is very good but isn't omnipotent for this reason that if that's right then it seems to me that we don't have any if, if you're a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim and you believe that God isn't omnipotent as well as very good then ultimately you don't have any sure ground for your faith in as much as you can't be sure that God is going to win that good is going to triumph over evil in the end now that is the ground of the Christian hope and the Jewish hope and the Muslim hope and if that ground is not there, then, well, the Jewish hope, as I understand. The only ground that requires faith. The well, only faith that a religious person has to have, that, vict that victory will ultimately go to the good over the evil. And that is the concept of in that day the Lord will be king of all the universe and all will obey him. Yes, I mean, that, yes, I mean but, but that, the essence is that God has to have a victory in the end. Yes, and, that's, and that's what gives our history meaning. That's Absolutely. so fulfilling. 
Of course, the whole point, because our conception of what is good changes as the years go by. What survives in due course will be thought to be good. So inevitably, oh, what... Hitler will never what, be thought to be good. Uh, no, self-destructive behavior will never be thought to be good. No, and indeed, but it won't survive. Yeah, but, but indeed, that, that's the point. No, the, only, the, the idea, I think it's quite right, the idea that <clears throat> there was a sense of God the creator creating a sense of oneness of mankind, humanity, and a, a sense of goodness was always there. The problem arose when people thought his goodness was associated with his power. And the Old Testament said, if you do good, you'll be rewarded. It didn't happen that way. So they said, you won't be rewarded now, you'll be rewarded in the world to come. That doesn't help us suffering in this world. So this is where we have to readjust and we have to say, God needs our help. He is there to, 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 to move us on to greater battles. Anthony Blair. Oh, um, or recognizing that we are created in the image of God Absolutely. and uh, that from that the argument of free will has to be looked at because if we are created in the image of God then we are co-creators with God but we have the freedom God isn't the only one who is omnipotent in that sense we have the freedom well, we ask the question, if God intervened in the Exodus to liberate the Jewish people why didn't he intervene at Auschwitz and the point is that probably God only intervened to the extent that he inspired Moses to take a slave people and give them freedom and give them a constitution of the Ten Commandments. And, but we, I think we have to accept that God works through humanity. And to think that he can intervene in an omnipotent fashion is what destroys our faith in him, because he doesn't do it. We feel that the, the, the case uh, for evil against God will appeal to people the more they feel that the only evils in the world are pains and the only goods are pleasures. There is a great value in people having an opportunity not just to have kicks of pleasure but to really be involved with other people and to make choices that make a difference to the future of the world. We have the right, with respect to those whom we are in a parental situation vis-a-vis, -vis, to allow them to suffer a little for the sake of their greater good. We have this right to a limited extent with respect to our own children. We allow them to suffer, sometimes, for the sake of a little good to them. God is so much more responsible for our existence than we human parents are for the existence of our children. Therefore, he who keeps us in being every moment will, uh, has the right to allow us to suffer for a limited period in order that we may make a real contribution to the world by choosing whether to be courageous in the face of it, whether to help other people who are in difficulties. If we didn't have that choice, we would have lost a tremendous significance for what happens in the world. I think it's despicable nonsense, if I may say so. I think I would like to see you nailed to a cross in order that you should experience the, the extremes of pain. I would like to see you raped. I would like to see you hung, hang, hung, drawn and quartered. That would make me feel very comfortable because it would give you such pleasure. Yeah. Let, me, let me bring in the Arthur Peacock. <laughs> In some senses, the, the God I believe in was nailed to a cross, God's own self in one sense. And I think we've been um, too glibly accepting a classical philosophical statement of God, which even Father McCabe, in the way he's argued, is pointing towards the, at least the God who is the father of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and, and even more so the God who is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who who is not just simply this abstract entity who is omniscient and, om and all the rest of it, omnipotent and absolute good. He is that. But then we have to qualify what we mean by those terms and refer to the God whom we, people have actually experienced. And uh, I think one's got to take on board that in some sense the omnipotence is limited by, as, uh, as Richard Swinburne has said, God can only do that which is logically possible to do. He can only know that which is not about which there is a fact of the case. Right, so that's already a qualification of omnipotence and omniscience. The rabbi said that God needs us, but I also think it's the other way around, that we need God. It's a two-way process. 
And I don't want to apologize at all or be defensive about the idea that God's omnipotence is in some way limited. I don't think that's a reduction in the, our image of God. It's a strengthening of the image. It's a strong personal image. It's a God who loves and calls us to respond at enormous cost. Yes, there is an omnipotent power there, but it's a power of love which can overcome even in the Gulag and even in Auschwitz. Does that mean prevent it? No. But it does mean overcome the trivialization that can take place with great and enormous cost. And I think if you read the Bible, that is the sort of power we're talking about, not the sort of power that's being suggested here. So, so where has Karen got it wrong? I think that Karen is... I'm, I'm very close to Karen. I want to put my arm around her shoulder and say that I am very, very close to her in everything she says. And I think that I emphasize and agree with a very large part of her message. Where I part company is in the final conclusion. Not necessarily on intellectual grounds, because I share her intellectual problems. And that's why I don't like Richard Swinburne's intellectual solutions. I, I think it's obscene uh, to try and defend the suffering of the world in the way he does. For, for clarification, it's a point I wanted to ask Rabbi Sidney Brick to. You said God only intervenes through humanity. So what's the source of evil? Evil is the reality. There has to, the world has to be, have that uh, libido, the drive. Life drive is evil. Competition has evil aspects to it. That's the way it is. It's like death. It's, we, have to, we have to learn to live with the evil within ourselves. And we don't deny it, or nor do we say that we don't want to have it. We work with it, and we, and we, and we refine it. And, we, and the whole basis of religious teaching is to teach us how to restrain it sufficiently so that we can live with our fellow human beings. We don't cross the red light because it's dangerous, not only for ourselves, but for others. To cross the red light is to give in to the evil of wanting to be the first one to get, to get across the road. Uh, it's, uh, what, what is unfortunate is that uh, we s seem to suggest that uh, that evil is a bad thing. Evil isn't necessary for the uh, progress of mankind. No one denies that. But what re where religion comes in and where the belief in God comes in is to help us cope with the evil within us and to refine it so that out of evil does come, as someone pointed out, some good. It's a quite a hard line to evangelize on, uh, Professor Swinburne. Yes, come in again. Could we talk about Auschwitz a little since it's been mentioned? And since my views have been characterized as morally obscene, I'd like to focus on the hardest example for myself. Um, I hope in taking this example, I won't be thought morally callous. Uh, obviously, Auschwitz is a horrible thing, and I don't wish to deny that. And please don't let anybody think that anything I say is going to uh, in any way suggest it isn't. But that having been said, God wants the best of us. He wants us to be heroes. He's not interested in us just having a quirks, little tingles of pleasure every now and again. He wants us to be worthy people, be great people. And we can only be great people if there are great choices for us. And Auschwitz gave us great choices. It's not something I wish to see repeated, but one can be grateful for what was shown on that occasion. And finally, there is this great good for the victims that perhaps even they did not always appreciate, that they were of use. One of the terrible things that can happen to a man in our world is not to be of use, not to be of any use at all to anybody. One thing that the victims of Auschwitz were, were of use because it was their suffering which provided the opportunity for the German guards, who were also human beings and also had ter tremendous choices, to uh, make the choice. May you and we help. can be grateful for that too. Now, both, 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 speakers, both speakers mentioned the Holocaust, and, and, and you have uh, chosen to address the agony, and everybody would like to respond to you. Sister Eva Heyman first. Um, I do think it's obscene to say that people who suffered in the Holocaust um, were of use. But I do feel that um, the arguments we've used tonight of necessity tend to be theoretical. And the person who survived in my family and who was able to say after three years of being in camp that she got to know God got to know God through the love 
expressed by some of her, the other inmates. That doesn't justify the evil. That appears. I would respond to Professor Swinburne as having said something which was very brave and quite outrageous, and which was a stunning instance of mystical masochism. There can be no good that comes out of the monstrous evil of Treblinka and Ravensbrück and Auschwitz, Auschwitz and all the others that can weigh for a second in the balance the conversion of some people, the private religious <coughs> experience of others, the music of the uh, Erwin Schulhoff and the other people who wrote before they were gassed, which can weigh a pennyweight against the grief, suffering and misery of human beings who used to be described as God's creatures, but whom I would argue we should think of as our own creatures. Because man, having free will without God, knows that if he encounters evil, he will not invent a theological conundrum to see its validity. He will see in it the thing he must fight. Humankind has seen the most terrible concentrations of evil in the 20th century at the same time that it has understood more deeply what evil is and why it must fight against it. I had hoped, just possibly, that Professor Swinburne would take the one t half tolerable card that was available to him in this argument and say, man is enlightened by a vast evil into understanding what evil is. And instead, he slopes off into the path of people having had little religious experience, which seems to me, frankly, a trivialization of a vast evil. The, the memorial to Vietnam, a much lesser evil, is a pit lined with cement and, and slate going down into the ground. And it seemed the best statement that anyone in Washington could find to describe what had happened. Responding to a great evil like that, an empty hole in the ground is the only answer we've got in God's terms, because this has happened in the face of God and made a nonsense of the great claims. To man, there is and can only be the building of defences against evil. I'd like to agree with that. I think the only serious problem of evil is the problem of what we're to do about it. I don't see God as negotiating with the jailers at Auschwitz. I see him as dying in Auschwitz, to use Karen Armstrong's phrase. But when God dies, when the Christian God dies, he doesn't just die. He rises again. And hope rises again. I find it hard to believe that God has created evil to give us the opportunities to make heroes of ourselves mm. by fighting it. I would rather say the nature of man is good and evil. And God has given us a challenge to overcome the evil and become good or better. But, but surely this is a problem. I mean, we are the creation of God, allegedly. We are the creation. Isn't, yeah, we are, if we there are, is so much evil in us, original sin has been also, mentioned by several speakers. But there's also... If we have original sin, if we have all this evil in us that leads to things like the concentration but, camps, but isn't this a major problem? But no, but Why didn't God give us with... A, greater propensity to choose good rather than evil. Sue Masson? I just wanted to say something about suffering. I think people think that uh, because they haven't suffered too much themselves, they think it's good for people to suffer. I don't think it's good to suffer at all. Uh, if you break your neck or you have AIDS, it's, it's awful. And uh, what we want to do is to find ways to, to stop suffering. And the concentration camps weren't good. They were bad. And we ought to own up to the fact. And, Please, uh, and we I ought to... I do emphasise, I said that at the start. Yes, I, yes. Yes, they you were did. horrible things. But the point is whether uh, God should allow human beings the opportunity to let horrible things occur or whether he should nanny them, whether he should let them be masters of their fate to a... Uh, considerable extent or whether he should stop them all the time. Well, I'd, I'd like to bring in the people who will be carrying this debate through the next 30, 40, 50 years. Some of you are young. What do you think of uh, what you've heard tonight? Yes. I'd like to say that it's always seemed to me pathological that when we suffer pain, we want others to suffer the pain and the impotence too. Uh, if I have a toothache, seems to me the sensible thing that I shouldn't want the dentist to feel the pain, the toothache, or to be impotent. In fact, I want him, in his compassion, to have a certain distance from the pain and a certain potence, capability, to fix the pain. Yes. 
focused on the fact here tonight that evil may be defined as the absence of God. Um, and to Father McCabe, I, I would say that there is a sense, however, in which I think that actually evil is more than the sum total of each individual's negativity. And I think that it is that which the church has absolutely failed today to address. And if I could just say a couple of things, perhaps in the direction of Karen Armstrong, I'm slightly surprised actually that you simultaneously find it difficult to believe in original sin and understand Auschwitz, because I think there's a sense in which one does absolutely explain the other. I am going to pause you there because you will get the chance to speak with each other and we're running out of time. The penultimate word goes to Father McCabe. Yes, two words, I think, really. Um, one, I, I said myself, and I, I'm afraid I still hold this, that um, I do not understand and think I, co I couldn't expect to understand why there is moral evil in the world. I can understand easily why there is pain in the world. Um, we have um, clear ex explanations of this. Uh, moral evil does no good to the world at all, countries some. Um, but the second thing I want to do, if I may, is to um, warn my fellow Christians and other fellow Jews against the temptation to think they can get God off the hook um, by saying that he's not omnipotent. After all, he's, you know, things prevent him from doing things. If God is non-omnipotent, this is because there must be forces which he cannot control. Uh, this means that God is one of the creatures in the universe. Now, if this is true, then every case made against God is absolutely valid. In fact, the God who is not omnipotent seems to me to be an excellent description of the devil. A very large, powerful force in the world, uh, anti-human and wanting to destroy us and so on. And people who imagine that Christians wish us to worship that, worship the devil, naturally and quite rightly say the hell with Christianity. <laughs> well, I think you provoked what could be another hour of reaction, but there is no time for it. Karen Armstrong, if you can be as admirably concise as Father McCabe, I'd be grateful. Well, I think that we Christians, Jews and Muslims have a great deal to learn from Buddhists, some of whom feel that the idea of God is an unreligious, even a blasphemous idea. And one of the dangers of the idea, the traditional idea of a totally good God is that it makes, it makes it traditionally for very, very difficult for us to face the evil in ourselves. And the end result of that has been that we've often projected it out onto other people. For example, the Jews um, in, in Europe. Um, what perhaps is important, however, that we shouldn't jettison from religion is uh, the idea of prayer. Uh, or the idea of a struggle to try and understand, try to face the horrors of the world, and ultimately to try and find some ultimate value and meaning in human life against all the dispiriting evidence to the contrary. Now, we may, as the spiritual writers say, come up against a cloud of unknowing, um, a dark night of the soul. I personally don't feel, after Auschwitz, that we should engage in worthy justifications of an old idea of God. I think we should enter the cloud of unknowing and say that in the face of the evil we've seen in this century, um, we don't know, um, and let us keep silent in the dark night. Karen Armstrong you know, declared herself a passionate atheist. And she was more impressive, I thought, than yes. Father McCabe, who I thought was very theological, very logical, yes. but in the end didn't have an answer to the suffering. Would, would, would then you would just despise myself? Well, I probably would, but I mean, I, I, whether I despise myself or not, I would have become worse as a human being. It was so theoretical, and I think Karen's argument is also hypothetical. Mm -hmm. It's it's not sufficiently from from any known experience. Traditional theism, Swinburne's kind of theism, yeah. um, was in some sense meaningless because. If these Oxford debates on the existence of God have reached no unassailable conclusion, you're surely not surprised 
But I hope you have been enlightened, stimulated by the arguments, as well, no doubt, as exasperated or outraged by the discussions here tonight, which we add in humility to the centuries of debate held in Oxford, from where though the talking goes on, we must now say goodbye. Next Saturday, the debate centered on creation or evolution. Is science good evidence for God? And that's at the same time, 7 o'clock.